worship with us this morning as we sing. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has, oh, he has made me
our hands and praise him this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. First word and I'm late. Turn around and shake somebody's hand. Greet them in the name of the Lord. Let them know that you are happy to see them here today. Praise God. Hallelujah. Now you may wonder uh, what is the privilege of having me up here today and uh, my ugly mug for first word, amen. And I trust that you did receive your packet, everybody that received your packet just kind of wave it like this, that you received that packet. Praise God. The Last Supper, this was the lesson Brother Bobby was going to be teaching on today. He taught Purpose Institute yesterday, uh, the Spanish side of Purpose Institute, and called me on the phone, and his voice was about gone, and he came by the office, him and his wife, and we talked for a little bit, and I said, well, Brother Bobby, do you think? He said, well, I think I'm going to try to get through it. I said, well, just put the mic close to uh, your mouth, and, and uh, you know, you might be able to do it. I said, but you let me know if you can and he said, okay. And so at 8 o'clock this morning, uh, he let me know that he thought his voice was not going to be any better. And I said, that's okay. you got to teach all this week a bunch of high school kids. So you need to make sure you got the voice for that. Brother Bobby does a good job. And I always doubted in my mind when he said that because Brother Bobby is not, you know, just this uh, monotone kind of a teacher. No, he gets excited. So I didn't want him to blow that out. So just for your information... This is the uh, devotional that he would have given out to you, and uh, would have uh, you would have followed this, uh, uh, but uh, uh, that's not what I'm going to be teaching on today, all right? <laughs> Praise God. So let's go to Genesis, the third chapter. You turn to your neighbor again and say, I'm so glad you're here at First Word this morning. We love Brother Bobby. He does a fantastic job. Amen. But uh, sometimes life just happens, and we've had several that have lost their voice here, sicknesses. They're trying to get through it, and uh, believe you me, this morning I popped my vitamin C. I was chewing on it. I'm like, man, I don't want none of this stuff going around. Uh, but uh, I have gotten several calls uh, about that, uh, people sick. You know, sometimes when people get uh, in... Uh, uh, you know, somebody says, well, Pastor, you won't have a problem doing first word. you got the gift of gab. You can just go on forever. And that is true. I just looked at the clock. Uh, well, that clock's a little fast, so we're doing good. Amen. Genesis 3, 1 through 5. Did you see that little switch right there? It's because I forgot what I was going to say. <clears throat> now, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat. Notice that. I want you to hear that. The woman said unto the serpent. The woman. Everybody say the woman. Turn to your neighbor and say the woman. The woman. I don't mean anything by that. Just it's what the Bible says. <laughs> Amen. The woman. The woman said unto the serpent. Verse 2. We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest ye, what? Lest ye die. And the serpent said to the woman, ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, there, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be gods, knowing good and evil. Good and evil. Lord God, we thank you this morning for your word. Amen, because truly, Lord God, it is what leads and guides us in everyday life. Amen, I pray, God, that we would be receptive to it, that our ears would be open to hear, hearts open to receive what you would speak unto us today. Amen, as we glorify your name and thank you for it. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray and everybody say amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> now, uh, we live in a internet savvy society generation uh, 
my uh, grandkids probably know their way around an iPad and an iPhone better than I do. Uh, they are, they use them in school. Uh, they're very, very tech savvy. But there's one thing I do know in getting into computers because I don't know, some of you, young, you well, everybody's a little older here today, so y'all might know. But how, how many remembers when the first kind of desktop version computer come out? I got mine at Radio Shack. They were the ones that carried it. It was the Tandy 1000 SX. Man, I thought that was, I thought I had, I had arrived. Yeah, I thought I had arrived. It was over $2,000 back then. Man, it was getting it. And so I can remember back when uh, we had the, Brother Darren, it was a floppy disk. We didn't have the big hard drive. It wouldn't, it wouldn't hold anything much at all except some of the programming it already had in it, but it had the floppy disk. But I remember when they started dealing with all this kind of stuff and, the, and everything has kind of rapidly progressed that they started talking about firewalls. Firewalls. How many ever heard that term in uh, one time or another? And so fire, the word firewall is not only common, a common uh, vernacular, but also it's, it's, it's an essential component for the proper functioning of that computer. You have to have it. And to ignore the firewalls and what their value is, is to put yourself at risk of losing all that is dear to you on your hard drive. How many has ever lost your information on your hard drive? How many has had a hard drive crash on you before? That's frustrating. It's downright irritating because you had no backup. Have you ever had that happen to you? <clears throat> I remember as a district years ago when our hard drive cashed and it had all the financials. And we had to send it to someplace in California. And luckily, Brother Singer, somebody out there had the IQ and the brains to salvage and it didn't, you know what? It didn't matter how much money we had to pay. You paid it. You paid for the expertise of somebody that knew what they were doing. But firewalls are a necessity in that world. And so I want to parallel that with our spiritual walk with God. How's that? Is that okay this morning? Because we need to activate a spiritual wall in our lives against a word that I want to focus on this morning, deception. We all kind of understand what deception is, right? It's kind of quiet. Because probably all of us, one time or another in our life, have been a deceiver. We've practiced deception. We've kind of said something in a phrase that we wanted to kind of be, well, it's not really because we want somebody else to have a narrative or we give them a narrative or give them a word. So we need to activate a spiritual wall against deception. And so here in our text, as we were reading, uh, verse 3, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of garden, God has said, ye shall... Not eat it, but neither shall you touch it, lest ye die. Now, where was this dialogue coming from? The dialogue was coming from Eve. She's communicating to Satan that, look, this is what we are allowed to do and what we're not allowed to do. If we do this, God said we're going to die. <clears throat> well, he picks up on that and says, no, woman. No, woman, you, shan't, you won't surely die. He said, you know, understand, God, God knows that in the day that you eat thereof, your eyes are going to be open, and you shall be God's, little g, little g, knowing good and evil. Spiritual firewalls. It's important in our life today. 
Literally years worth of information can be lost in a moment's time. If you fail to maintain an adequate firewall. It's got to be part of your standard equipment. Everybody say standard. It's part of that baseline stuff. You got to have it. It's an integral part of what you're trying to do because viruses don't care about our knowledge base or our attentions. Doesn't care about our schedule, right? Our value of what is at risk of being lost. Sister May, let me ask you a question. If, if, if in your phone right now, how many thousand pictures do you have in your phone? A bunch, right? She's got a bunch. I've got a bunch. Now, I can honestly say that my pictures are, are you know, basically my grandkids. I don't really care about anything else. And if it's something in there that I took a picture of just to kind of remember something, I'll go back and erase it. But did I? 24,000? 24,000 pictures. 24,000 pictures. That's a lot of pictures, Brother Darren. But let me ask, let me ask you something. Sister May, what would happen in the next five minutes if all of a sudden something would go wrong with your phone and you would lose all those pictures? Do you have a backup? What happens if they do a, 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 um, a electri- electronic ma- mag- EMP and it just shoots all the electronics and you lose the cloud? Would you, would you cry? No? Okay. But the information that you had, you couldn't recover. See, that's the point that, 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 that uh, we're trying to make here in this world. Viruses don't care when you get them. How many remembers that when they started coming out? Norton and all these different security companies coming out and people were buying left and right. Why? Because it just seemed like somebody was hacking all the time or that you were getting a virus and you couldn't do things. It just it was frustrating. It was aggravating it was agitating because you just couldn't do anything because you didn't have anything to fight against that virus to keep it out right amen so it doesn't care about the value of what you have it doesn't care about your attentions it doesn't care about the risk see ignorance and being too busy it's not an excuse against having your firewall in place to help you when that attack comes, right? And it will come. Turn to your neighbor and say, it will be there. It will show up. It will come. The attack will happen. So a firewall, a firewall, a, fire, a firewall in the computer world, or uh, you just let's just look at it as a principle. What, what is a firewall? A firewall is known to be a gatekeeper. A gatekeeper of the information, the flow of information, things that are coming in and, 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 and out of your, of your computer. So a firewall is a gatekeeper whom on one hand exits, exists rather to block Unwelcome traffic, while on the other hand, it allows traffic that is deemed acceptable to come in. So look at it as though you've got somebody there as a gatekeeper that says, stop or come on. It's what it is. It's a gatekeeper. The flow of information. What you deem acceptable to come. So the Holy Ghost. Everybody say the Holy Ghost. Everybody say that's the real thing. The Holy Ghost is that spiritual firewall that you and I need in our lives. Without it, the viruses are going to come. Our lives are going to be affected by it. See, the most important thing to recognize about a firewall is that it implements implements an access control policy. Look look at your neighbor and say, what do you allow to access your life? What do we allow to access our lives? 
you know, you hear me sing this song, Sister Murray. You hear me sing it every now and then. I, I just like, I don't know all of it, but I can remember it as a kid. Be careful, little ears, what you hear. Be careful, little ears, what you hear. For your father up above is looking down with love. So be careful, little. And the eyes and your mouth, whatever, all that kind of stuff, right? Right? That little song that you teach your kids, why? Because you're trying to put something in them to say, you know what? I need to have something that will control the information that comes into my life. Right? And to block the stuff that's bad and to let the good things in. Right? A control policy. Because if you don't have a good idea of what kind of access you want to allow into your, into your life or to deny, right? Then, then really, a firewall really won't help you. No matter how effective it can be, unless you know what you're going to allow to come in and what you're going to keep out. You have to dictate that. You have to set that perimeter. You have to put the roadblock up. And then you set the word of God in place to operate. I was so aggravated this week because I couldn't set the alarm here at the church. Why? We had an air conditioner that was bad. All of our air conditioners are alarmed. So if somebody tries to steal them, which they have in the past, then, then the minute they cut, a, cut the thing, cut the whatever, the alarm goes off. Well, they, they called me once and said, hey, you got a problem with the one air conditioner? And, uh, and so I'm like, okay. And then they called me again. After the second time, I couldn't set the alarm. So I was getting frustrated because I couldn't set the alarm. And you know what's more frustrating than not knowing how to set the alarm or, or can't, set, you can't set the alarm? Was, so she, I didn't know how to bypass. I didn't know the code to bypass the problem. That's aggravating when you don't have the information to be able to bypass the problem and be able to still operate the security system. Now take that one and chew on it for a little bit. Because when you look at the internet today, it's God awful. Right? How many can admit that the internet today you go on and you search the stuff that you want to search, but then they're trying to feed you all this other stuff in your mind and all the ads and all these different things, and, 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 and really you're in charge of, 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 you know, trying to do it. But listen, the Internet, I want you to see the Internet like a spiritual realm. All right? It's plagued with those who enjoy the electronic equivalent of what? A thief. A thief. <clears throat> what, what's the Bible say about the thief? The, the, you know, the Lord said, the thief cometh, cometh but what? To steal, to kill, and destroy. Now, I, I, could, I could actually look at the internet and say that's what it does. It's like a thief. It comes to people's lives, and it wants to steal, it wants to kill, and it wants to destroy. We have to be aware of that. We have to put the perimeters up. There's got to be a firewall. There's got to be something in our life that withstands. There's got to be a, 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 a something in our life that dictates, that controls what goes on, what comes in, and what goes out. Our spiritual life matters. Turn to your neighbor and say, your, your spiritual life matters. Because when that firewall is used properly, once again, it's going to keep out unwelcome thieves out of your network while still allowing you to get your work done. Now, I know, me and my wife know what it is to get hacked. Has anybody ever been hacked? How about your email? I've had people calling me before in a panic, telling me, hey, if you get something from me, I've been hacked. How many's ever got those kind of emails before? See, you got to understand that this is going to happen. This in this world, as far as this is concerned, it's going to happen. 
the network. It's there. So me and my wife, we go do our taxes. Most of you know this. So let me give you a short version of it. We could do our taxes, right? We get a check back in the mail. We never get checks in the mail. They always go to our bank account. And we don't really worry about it because it's, you know, it just, you know, it wouldn't pay your CG&E bill. But I got a check back for $5,437. What can we do with this? And then they also sent something electronically to the bank that they normally do. Hmm, man. So somebody said, well, pastor, you just need to go ahead and cash that check. I'm like, yeah, a fool has said in their heart that you can cheat the government. So no. So we had to go through all this policy, all these different things. we got to have a number now to file our taxes from now on. We sent that back to them. We got a hold of them in, in, in uh, uh, Kansas City. And uh, they said, well, send it to us. That was back in May. We just got a letter here what, last week that says we have received. I was kind of hoping that that was going to send the our return, you know. That's what we filed back in early April or whenever it was. But they're just telling me, oh, we just want you to know we just got that. But here, here's the point. My point is, is that simply that, that the enemy's working overtime to always try to infiltrate. Let me go to the spiritual sense. Infiltrate our lives. And the only way that we can withstand that is by putting ourselves or putting the proper spiritual things in our life that can keep it out. Because when a firewall is used properly, it will keep it out. Everybody say keep it out. So what is deception? Deception. Everybody say deception. Now, I'm going to read this and you just kind of think about it. To mislead by giving a distorted impression uh, or false sense of reality, to trick, to cheat, to beguile. Now, the ancient Greeks used the word to describe the pleasure that comes from watching theater. Because it isn't that what theater is all about. Deception is being placated by unreality. We live in a world many times of fiction. The things we read, the movies they watch, and all of that stuff, you, you, you get into it, but it's not real, it's just a story. It's fiction. Reality, it's not. And that's why so many people, when they get a book or something out or whatever, that's based on a true story. It seems to have a little bit more impact in their life. But understand, deception is being placated by unreality. But pain and confusion result from trusting false promises. How many times have you ordered something from a catalog? (laughs) Come on, fess up. We're old enough to remember the Sears catalog, Montgomery Wards. You remember that? We're old enough. The young guys downstairs, they don't have a clue. But we, we, I can remember taking it and looking through and saying, this is what I want for Christmas. Right? Now, I must be honest. What they made back then versus what they make today, they're, they're not even in the same. You'd be paying an arm and a leg for what they made back then and how they made it. But let, I, I digress. Let me say this. 
You look in the catalog, you see it, you like it. My wife, God love her, she loves Amazon. And she loves Timu. Is that, no, that's not right. That's right. Timu, because we're always getting some kind of a package in the mail. And I don't know how many times she'll open that box of shoes or whatever, and it's like, well, this is not what it looks like. I don't think this is right. Yeah, that's what you ordered. That's what the picture showed you. That's what the description is, but this is the product. How many has ever felt that way when you got something? You're like, what? Well, most of us is going to leave that sitting around. Not my wife. She's going to pack it back up, and she's going to notify me that I need to take it back to UPS or post office or, and make sure you get a, yeah. Because not everything you look at is really what it is. Deception is a scary thing. Why? Because it's deceptive. Interesting, deception is only an option for a Christian believer. Why do you say that, Pastor? Because really, non-believers are already led astray. Because in order to be deceived, you, you must have some truth, Brother John, to measure your error by. Truth to measure your error by. You have to have. Right? See, that's what's important. That's what's important. Again, when you look back at our text, let me just read it again real quick if you don't mind. Now, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat the every tree garden. And the woman, the woman said, Everybody say the woman. It's always the woman. No, that's not true. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree. See, she had the knowledge. Now, I'll explain something in a minute. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And then the serpent said, "Uh, you won't die, for God doth not. God, God knows that in the day you eat thereof, your eyes are going to be open. You should be as God's, knowing good and evil. Now, Satan will always try to determine the authority Of the word of God. Because deception compromises divine provision and protection. So, notice this. Let me ask a question. Why does Satan deceive? Man, I I could really just keep on preaching until noon. (laughs) I'm, I'm not going to get this done. Why? Everybody say, why? Why Why does Satan deceive? Are you okay for just a moment? Because Satan cannot create anything. Everybody say, he's not a creator. creator. Turn to your neighbor and say, he's not a creator. creator. He did not create anything. All he can do is manipulate, manipulate that which has been created. You are a created being. He cannot create, Elder, but he can manipulate the creation. So if we exclude the Word of God, firewall, out of our life, then he can manipulate us. If we don't have the Holy Ghost dwelling in our life, he can manipulate us. He could cause you to start doubting the Word of God or questioning the Word of God or saying, well, I don't think it really means that. Turn to your neighbor and say, Pastor, better quit now. He's getting on a roll. <clears throat> Let me say that again. I want you, to, I want you, you might need to write this down. It's no, it's no big statement, but it might help you. Satan cannot create anything. All he can do is manipulate 
that which has been created. And so since he can't match God's power, and he can't, he has to maximize the power that he has. And he does that through deception. Deception is his strong point. And believe you me, he's turned it into an art form. He's crafty. He knows how to manipulate the creation. So the greatest guard against deception is knowledge. Everybody say knowledge. And understand this. This might be something you need to write down too. Knowledge, <clears throat> knowledge is revealed, not communicated. So this knowledge concerning the tree, in this instance in Genesis, had been communicated how? God revealed it to Adam. Everybody say Adam. Amen. So it had been communicated through Adam to Eve. It was not revealed to Eve. It did not come from God. It came from God revealing it to Adam and Adam communicating it to Eve. So Eve technically was operating on secondhand information. And hear me today when I tell you this. If all you ever receive is secondhand truth, you are in trouble. You are in deception already and probably don't even know it. Because what is Satan's weapon? It's his mouth. You know what serpent is? In the Hebrew, nakesh means one who whispers, one who hisses, hiss. Everybody say hiss. I miss Sister Clark because every time I do that, she'd go. <laughs> or one who suggests, whispers, hisses, suggests. Satan's deception always causes distrust and spiritual authority <clears throat> for spiritual authority and doubt of the truth. Distru he always wants you, hey, spiritual authority, distrust it. Truth, doubt it. That's how he operates. Not only did he, Satan, cause Eve to rebel against God, but to misconstrue the words of her earthly authority, if I might say it that way. Adam, her husband, misconstrue them. Why do people have rebellion in their hearts today? Why won't children today naturally obey their parents. I can tell you why. It's because it's the enemy's strategy to destroy the human race. If you leave us to our own device, our own devices, and all we have is him speaking into our lives, we would eventually destroy each other. He is a hater, not a lover. He hates you, therefore he tries to destroy you. He doesn't want any of us to have the hope of heaven. He just wants us, if I can say it this way, go to hell. That's where he's going to spend eternity. That's where the lost is going to spend it, right? And so to him, it's like, no, I've been there. 
and I don't want you to experience it, so I'm going to do everything I can to manipulate you, to deceive you into not receiving the Word of God or not applying it to your life. You cannot, I don't want you to have that spiritual authority in your life to be able to repel my deception, so I'm going to try to destroy you. Deception. Once again, to mislead by giving distorted impression or false sense of reality to trick, to cheat, to beguile. To cheat, to beguile. Distort. Distort what? What God says by changing the emphasis. That's not what he meant. This is really what he meant. I'm just going to give you the points. That was point one. Point two, what, what's he trying to do? He wants you to question God's motive. He don't want you to be like God's. He doesn't want you to understand knowing good and evil. Three, what's he want to do? Introduce reason that ultimately leads you to question God's integrity. And once he accomplishes that, it's easy to turn you against God's authority. And just look wherever. Just look at people today. They are so at odds with God's authority. Folks, when, when I say this, you understand what I'm, I want you to understand why it's important to have a, fire, a spiritual firewall in your life. Here's why. Because the Bible says, and I'm going to quit with this because of time. Here's what it says. As it were in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. And when you go back and you study that out, and you begin to study the lifestyle that was going on back in that day and time, When God said, I've had enough. When you go back and study Sodom and Gomorrah and you see where God drew the line, Brother Darren, and he said, I've had enough. Now, the, the, the salvation of the human race came because, number one, he said, Noah, the Bible, Scripture says, Noah found grace in the eyes. Noah, his three sons, their wives, Noah's wife. Eight. Eight. He comes down, two angels, they're going to go destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And he says, my friend Abraham, how can I hide this from him? How can I hide this from him? And so he stops and sends the angels on and he begins to talk to Abraham and then Abraham begins to negotiate elder and he says, hey, peradventure, there's 50. Hey, you know what? I'll spare the city for 50 righteous. Well, how how about 40? I'll spare it. 30? I'll spare it. 20? I'll spare it. How about 10? I'll, I'll spare it for 10 righteous. And then Abraham basically came to the conclusion And he stopped asking. They went in. Lot, his wife, two daughters got out. And the angels had to get them by the hands and get them out. I, I, I'm just kind of of the opinion, and I could be wrong on this, but just allow me to have my opinion. My opinion is, is that if Abraham didn't have the relationship that he had with God, Lot and his family would have also died in Sodom and Gomorrah. Just my opinion. So, folks, I end it with this. You must have a firewall. You've got to have something in your life. And the only way you're going to stop the, the, uh, the, uh, the encroachment of the enemy in your life is through the Word of God, through the Holy Ghost. Turn to your neighbor and say, you need the Holy Ghost. You need the Spirit of God in your life. Without it, we have nothing to withstand the deception of the enemy. And in this day and time, we have to have it. We have to have it. As a child of God, you, couldn't, you cannot bow. You cannot, you, you cannot just kind of 
turn a blind eye to what's going on in the world and, and, and just say, well, you know, it, it is what it is. No, 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 no. Amen. Listen to me right now because what you allow in the world, if you're not careful, it's going to come into your life. It's going to come into your household. And if you allow it in your household, then it's going to come in the church. Now, I can preach this way, but we, we, we have to look at it from a standpoint, hey, he's talking about a firewall. He's, he's talking about something that's going to keep this stuff out, right? Turn to your neighbor and say, we got to keep it out. Don't forget. Don't forget. Satan led one-third of the angels astray from the presence of God in heaven. And then he caused Eve to disobey in a perfect, a perfect environment. <laughs> Man, a perfect utopia, paradise. But anytime the enemy has access to that paradise, he's always trying to manipulate God's creation. Think about that. I'm, I'm, I'm quitting. Let's stand together. Praise God. Was this okay this morning? Just say, hey, you got to listen to me in, in about 15 minutes too. So maybe I, ought to, maybe I ought to finish part of this. I don't know. But anyway, no, God's got something else for that time. Amen. But I want us to raise our hands and pray as we close this part of our session out and say, God, I want to receive your word with gladness. Help me, Lord, to build that in my life which will withstand the evilness of the, of the world and the enemy. Pray that way. Lord God, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for your word to instruct us, Lord, and how to withstand the fiery darts of the wicked one, the deception, the deceptive practices of the evil one that comes against us. Thank you, Lord, for your word that is that, that, that guard, that gateway that, that keeps out those things, hey man, that, that would destroy us or manipulate us. And I pray, God, today, help us to build that one block at a time. Amen. One block at a time through your word, God, building that, that, that wall in our lives to keep the deceptive powers of the wicked one out. God, help us to be true. Help us to stand true. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Hallelujah. Somebody say, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.